days to come. Matthew chapter number 8, verse 26. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful? O ye of little faith. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye fear, fearful? Now, they were out on the lake in a boat. The winds were there. The storm was there. He's asleep. My Bible tells me that the God I serve, he never sleeps and he never slumbers. So listen, there's no sense in us staying up. There ain't no sense in both of us staying up. If he's staying up, I'm going to bed. I'm going to sleep. Now, in my relationship with my spouse, and everybody has, I'm the type of person, we can be arguing, I'm going to bed. And I'm going to sleep. About three o'clock in the morning, Tina's going to say, are you awake? I'll say, no. Are you? I haven't been asleep at all. Well, then go watch TV. Go clean the house. Go do laundry. Go get breakfast ready. 
Go roll some biscuits. <laughs> when we built our home in our kitchen, it's nice, but it wasn't for use. It's just for resale value. We didn't know how that we would ever sell a house that didn't have a kitchen. Matthew chapter 14, verse 27. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. This time, Jesus comes walking on the water. Now, let me ask you a question. Now, I, 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 I'm dealing with spiritual folks today because you passed the test. So I know y'all are there. But can you imagine? You ever been out in a boat in the middle of the night? It is dark. And I'm a scaredy cat. Can you imagine being out on a, a boat? And all of a sudden, here comes this dude walking on water. You see him coming? Oh, no. I'm going over and under. But Jesus says, hey, it's I. Be not afraid. Matthew 17 and 7. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. St. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth. I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. And guess what? I could probably read another 500 scriptures just like those. And of course, time does not allow it. But let me give you a couple of statistics. Number one, fear is not rational. It's not based on fact. Researchers have found that 40% of the things that we worry about never happen. 40% of the things we worry about never happen. 30% are in the past and can't be helped. So 40% of what we worry about never happened. 30% of what we worry about is behind us. There's, there's no fixing it. 12% of what we worry about involves the affairs of others. And it's not even our business. Mind your own garden. Stay out of my garden. Quit walking on my crops. So 40% never happens. 30% is behind us. 12% is not our business. 10% what we worry about relates to sickness, real or imagined. That leaves only 8% of what we worry about that we are even like, that is even likely to happen. So out of everything that we worry about, the chances are only about 8% is likely to happen. The fact is, you don't have to live with anxiety and worry. Worry is a low-grade fear. It is interest paid on a trouble before it comes due. Hear that? It is interest paid on trouble before it comes due. I made mention a while ago about flying, but the, but the fact of the matter is this. You can have to fly every day for 19,000 days in a row or years before the chances of you dying on a plane. Have I been scared on a plane? Yes. Have I thought the plane was coming down? Yes. 
I was flying over Moscow. And they told us, do not fly on Russian airlines. So the group I'm with, they put us on Russian airlines. We're flying in the plane. All of a sudden, in the back of the plane, the whole plane starts caving in. It was like a domino effect. It started in the back, and it came all the way to the front. I said, Jesus, I love you. I'll be there in a few minutes. Go ahead and get supper ready. Bojangles chicken. Mashed potatoes and gravy and corn. I mean, come on. Have you ever been at that place where you thought that was it? I was coming out of Melbourne, Florida one Sunday morning. I had preached that week in Melbourne, and it was on Sunday morning. I'm trying to get back to Charlotte to uh, preach here on Sunday morning. We, go, we, we fly up out of Melbourne, and when you fly up out of Melbourne, you make that big turn. When they made the turn, the plane just went quiet. The whole plane just stopped. I was always told, good advice, I was always told when you're flying, always watch business people and everybody around you. As long as they're reading the newspaper, reading their books, doing their thing, don't worry about it. If they ever put it all down and they're taking notice, that's when you got to be scared. When nobody reading nothing, everybody was set up in their chair. One more time, I said, Lord, I'm not going to be preaching in Salisbury this morning. But if you would allow me, I'll preach in heaven because I'm getting ready to come home. I mean, there's those times when we think that's it. You say, well, what happened? It seemed like eternity, probably just a few seconds. I mean, everything, the lights went off, the engines went off, everything went off. And all of a sudden, whoa. I said, whoa. I did like Ric Flair. Where's my fur coat? We could all tell stories about that time when we thought that was it. We've all got, that's it. My friend Mike and Cece are here from Toledo. He drives for FedEx. I guarantee you driving from Toledo to Chicago a few times a week, he could tell you about all kinds of stories when he thought, that's it. But guess what? He's still here. Guess what? I'm still here. Guess what? Pinch yourself. You're still here. You know why? Because there's not enough devils in hell to take you out until it's God's time for you to go home. He's already given you so many days on this earth. He knew when you were going to be born. He knows when you're going to die. He knows who's going to preach your funeral. He knows, come on, he knows the end to the beginning. He knows everything about you. So why are you fearing this morning? Ain't it amazing how when everything's great and wonderful, we love like Psalms. I know the plans I have for you, plans that prosper you. Y'all got that stuff plastered all over your house. Well, guess what? He does know the plans. He knows them from the day I die all the way back to this moment. My brother was killed a few years ago in Cabarrus County working on a house. Standing side by side with an atheist. Wood come flying down through the roof. Literally took my brother out never touched a guy standing a couple feet away who didn't even believe in God. My brother was a a preacher. We were getting ready to start a church in Mooresville. Had a great family. And just like that, he's taken out of this life. And I remember my uncle Johnny go there standing up at his funeral. And he made this comment. He said, a thousand devils could not have caused it and a thousand angels could not have stopped it. It was God's timing. Mark chapter five, verse 35. While yet, while he had yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogues, how certain which said, 
Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And he come up to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and seeth the turmoil and them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, Why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. Go, go back to verse 39, one second. And he saith unto them, Why make ye this ado? He's not talking about a hairstyle here. We're going to come back to that because if I would ask you, what does that mean? Verse 40. And they laughed him to scorn, but when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him and entered into where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand of the young lady and said unto her, uh, which is being interpreted, damsel, lay aside unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, and she was of the age of 12 years, and they were astonished with great astonishment. Now, I want you to understand. They said she was dead. Jesus said she's not dead. Be, don't be afraid. Da, da, da. He went into the room. They prayed. He took her by the hand, and she arose up. But I want to go back to verse 39 because it's very, very important that you get this. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, why, why make ye this ado and weep? That word ado can be translated as commotion, clamor, or uproar. Jesus was really saying, you are making much ado about Nothing. I want you to get it. That word ado can be translated as commotion, clamor, or uproar. And Jesus was simply saying, you are making much ado about nothing. They said she's dead. He said she's but asleep. To the enemy's delight, we choose to make much ado about nothing at times. Even in our own personal lives. Somehow you and I have got to stop doing that. In these days in which we live, you are either going to be a warrior or a warrior. A warrior or a warrior. You're going to be one or the other. There will be no middle ground. When you hear bad news, learn, learn, learn to be a warrior and not a worrier. Fear is the opposite of faith. You cannot have faith and fear at the same time. If you have fear, then you have no faith. If you have faith, then you're not going to have to worry about fear. You say, well, how do I combat it? By the word of God. By the word of God. When the devil, when you feel fear coming upon you, begin to quote scriptures. Get into the word. Turn off the TV. Get into the word. Listen, you can't watch news 24-7 and expect to be running over with faith. Does it matter what channel you watch? We've got to put faith inside of us. We've got to deal with faith. Somebody say amen. amen. Psalms 56 3. Let me read it right here. What time I'm afraid, I will trust in thee. What time I'm afraid, I will trust in thee. Listen, none of us knows what tomorrow holds. 
We would have never dreamed that we would be here at this point. But I know who holds tomorrow. I, I, I just know. <laughs> Tina and I were flying out this afternoon. Flights are bought. Everything is taken care of. This was the only week that we had that we could possibly get out of town for several weeks. And uh, we canned all of that. Not because of the coronavirus, because of the unknown. Tomorrow morning, how many of you parents who need to go to work, but you don't know what to do with your kids? And if, if that's a need, Cornerstone's going to fix it. We're fixers. So listen, if you're a parent, single, married, whatever, it doesn't matter, and there's no school tomorrow, and you got to go to work, and you don't, you, you don't have nowhere to put your child. We will do whatever we got to do to work it out to help you. We will, we will do anything we, anything we can do. Another thing, all these kids that are going to school that normally eat breakfast and lunch at school, what are they going to do about eating? I tell you what we're going to do as a church. We're going to step in the gap and we're going to help feed children. We're going to help send food home. You know why? Listen to me. This country is too blessed for anybody to be starving, for anybody to be hungry. That's not the will of God. That's not the will of God. We are too blessed for anybody to be hungry in this country. Board of Directors, I'm going to be careful how I say this, so don't freak out on me. But the Board of Directors met on Thursday night. And we decided that we were going to take a large sum of money out of the bank and put it into a safe at an undisclosed location. Because what if the banks shut down and you don't have food to eat? I'm serious. We are our brother's keepers. We're not going to listen. We're not going to let you go without food. Not if we can find it. We're not going to let you go without gasoline. Not if we can find it. Come on. We're not going to sit back and have money in a bank somewhere, but we can't get to it, and we're, and we're all starving to death. Amen. We have, Michelle's here. We have several daycare workers who provide for three or 400 families to work. Some of them tomorrow can't come to work because they don't have nowhere to put their kids. So guess what? We stepping up. Because if these families have to stay at home to take care of their kids, guess what? In two weeks' time, they got a major crisis because now they don't have no money. If nobody else is going to stop and think in this doggone country, then we will. Hello. People have to eat. People got to be able to live. People got to be able to pay electric bills. So we'll do whatever we got to do. Listen, that doesn't mean you go blow all your money, then come and ask us for some. You better, have, you better have a story to tell. <laughs> but at the same time, I told our board, I said, I'm sorry. If something like that would happen and we could not help, I don't think I'd ever forgive myself. I tell my kids all the time, as long as your dad has, and mom has, you've got. I tell this congregation this morning, 
As long as I have, you have. Because we are family.